from world news tonight toxicity takes over india plagued with disease as pollution levels rise to unprecedented highs humanitarian heartbreak afghanistan suffers the ripple effect of the taliban takeover the jab race citizens in the eu rush to get inoculated in a slew of new covid curves christmas charm lights lasers and projections dazzle windsor great park from the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with updates on the growing climate crisis. India's capital, New Delhi, one of the world's most polluted cities, is once again choking under a thick cloud of toxic smog. And doctors say the poor air quality is leading to an alarming rise in respiratory illness among children. India temporarily shut five coal-fired power plants on Wednesday to try to combat the chronic winter smog that has enveloped New Delhi. It's threatening the lives of residents. Pediatricians at this hospital in one of the world's most polluted capitals are seeing an alarming increase in children with allergies, wheezing, respiratory and breathing issues, and say the yearly smog poses a danger to their medium and long-term growth, both physical and cognitive. This is Dr. Arvind Buntra of the Max Super Speciality Hospital. So, you know, it's hit them really bad. So the number of patients that we are getting now because of respiratory infections, both in the OPD or in the emergency, there has been a three to four fold rise in their uh, number of visits to the hospital. Uh, this is directly linked uh, to the high levels of pollution that the city of Delhi and NCR is witnessing in the last seven to 10 days. The order to temporarily shut the power stations came from a panel of the Federal Environment Ministry, which also extended the closure of schools until further notice. Deadly pollution hits New Delhi every year. As falling temperatures trap deadly pollutants from the power stations outside it, along with fumes and burning garbage. Levels surged to severe this month, with New Delhi's Air Quality Index, which measures fine particles that can get lodged in the lungs, reaching 499 on a scale of 500, indicating healthy people were also at risk of developing respiratory illnesses. Anything above 60 is considered unhealthy. The body of a woman was recovered from one of the mudslides caused by extremely heavy rainfall in the Pacific Coast Canadian province of British Columbia as the severe weather continued to displace thousands. After a month's worth of rain in just two days, partially blue skies suggest a light at the end of the tunnel across British Columbia. In what's been described as a once-in-a-century weather event, Torrential storms battered the Canadian province on Monday and Tuesday, leaving some towns submerged under floodwaters and triggering landslides in others. Thousands of people across the region were evacuated, with helicopters sent into the hardest affected areas to free people who had been trapped for hours without water or food. The mayor of Abbotsford, where over 1,100 homes were evacuated, described the storm as the worst the region has seen in nearly seven decades. The flooding and mudslides have left a number of people displaced. Families and friend, family and friends are pitching in to help, and more than 80 families have checked into our reception center. At least one person was killed in a mudslide, though authorities warn the death toll could climb as search and rescue efforts continue. Floodwaters also forced the closure of several railways, oil pipelines, and Canada's largest port in Vancouver which is likely to disrupt the movement of essential commodities for several days. While provincial cabinet ministers will meet Wednesday to weigh declaring a province-wide state of emergency, Justin Trudeau has said the federal government will provide whatever assistance is necessary. Nearly three months after the chaotic withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan, the economy of the country is in utter shambles, creating a heartbreaking humanitarian disaster. A nurse at a clinic in Herat, run by Doctors Without Borders, measures Farzana's arm. If the band goes red, she's severely malnourished. Farzana is nearly at the end of the scale, weighing six and a half pounds at eight months old. As U.S. troops pulled out, the Taliban took over and aid money stopped. Now, the people are starving. 
Occupancy here is up 70% compared to last year. Ali Umar's mother was herself malnourished, so the baby was born too weak to suckle. Things have gotten worse since the Taliban came. What little we had went to zero. The babies here are given a fortified blend of formula. In this ancient city, there is plenty of food. Only the poorest people can't afford it. Like in this neighborhood, where the elders say work has disappeared since the Taliban took over. Then Murad Khan, a day worker, made a shocking admission. His daughter, Benazir, is eight years old. She was sold to another family to marry one of their sons when she reaches puberty. The buyers haven't paid for Benazir yet. The agreed price, her dowry, is $2,000. As soon as they pay it, they'll come to collect her. Benazir's family survive by begging. They burn trash to bake bread because they can't afford wood. Benazir and her best friend Saliha go to fetch water. The local mosque is kind enough to let them fill their pails. Together, the two girls walk back home. Benazir, just in torn socks. Saliha has been sold too. She's seven. Saliha's father says he knows she's too young, but that he had a terrible choice to make. Take the dowry now or watch all the family starve. Benazir and Saliha sit alone by their homes. The other girls, who like many here use henna to dye their hair red, keep a little distance. Perhaps weary, they too will soon become hunger brides. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken appealed for the preservation of democracy in politically and ethnically fractured societies as he opened his first official visit to Africa in Kenya amid worsening crises in neighboring Ethiopia and Sudan. It was largely ignored by the Trump administration, but the African continent is once again garnering the interest of the United States. Secretary of State Antony Blinken kicked off a three-nation tour on Wednesday the Biden government's first high-level visit to the continent. Blinken begins his tour in Kenya, one of the U.S.'s oldest African allies, and a key actor attempting to ease the war in Ethiopia, where the U.S. hopes to resolve deepening tensions. Uh, the people who suffer are the people, uh, and we have to make sure that uh, they are getting the assistance they need uh, and uh, that uh, the fighting ceases and the, the talking starts. Aside from the Tigray conflict in Ethiopia, the military coup in Sudan and tensions in Somalia are high on the agenda. Following Trump's failure to engage with Africa and amid China's growing influence, Blinken's trip also aims to raise Washington's profile anew on the continent. On Wednesday, Blinken also stated the importance of fighting what he labeled democratic recessions worldwide. Independent institutions uh, challenged and uh, undermined. Journalists, human rights activists, uh, threatened and attacked. Uh, even vibrant democracies like Kenya uh, experiencing these pressures. A week from COP26, climate change will also be on the table, as five of the ten hardest hit countries are in Africa. Blinken's next stop will be Nigeria and then Senegal. A federal judge sentenced the U.S. Capitol rioter known as the QAnon Sherman for his horned headdress to 41 months in prison for his role in the deadly January 6th attack by followers of the then-President Donald Trump. Jacob Chansley, nicknamed the QAnon Shaman, was sentenced to 41 months in prison on Wednesday for his role in the deadly January 6th attack by followers of then-President Donald Trump, one of the most severe punishments yet out of the hundreds charged with participating in the Capitol riot. Chansley sported a horned headdress, a bare chest, and face paint when he and others stormed the halls of Congress in an effort to disrupt the certification of U.S. President Joe Biden's election victory. In court Wednesday, Chansley read out a statement telling the judge, quote, the hardest part of this is that I know I am to blame. Mr. Chansley owned his responsibility. He sought to be accountable. His defense attorney, Albert Watkins, told reporters that Chansley respected the decision of the court and was working to repay his debt to society. He is absolutely embracing being held accountable. Prosecutors had asked for a harsher sentence, 51 months, while Chansley's attorney had asked the judge to sentence his client to time served, saying Chansley needed better mental health care and suffered greatly while awaiting trial in the custody of the U.S. Bureau of Prisons. The judge settled on 41 months in prison, the same punishment given another rioter who punched a police officer. 
But Chansley's lawyer said it was wrong to cast his client as some sort of insurrectionist or leader of some kind of conspiracy. An insurrectionist? Look up the word. Are you going to follow the guy who's naked, tattooed nipples, January, D.C., hours outside with horns, face paint, and a fur? And say, yeah, that's the guy I want. I'm following him. Most of the guilty pleas in January 6 prosecutions so far have been in cases involving nonviolent misdemeanors, but government lawyers are seeking prison sentences for some defendants facing more serious felony charges. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Britain looks set to become the first major economy to hike interest rates since the COVID-19 pandemic began, after inflation data showed prices rising at the fastest rate in a decade. For more on this, we have other day in the World News Special Correspondent Hasithi Abhay reporting now from Leeds in the United Kingdom. Hasithi? Yes, Anuradhi. The largest upward contribution to the CPIH 12-month inflation rate came from housing and household services driven significantly by the price rises of electricity, gas and other fuels. Inflation rose steeply in October to its highest rate in nearly a decade. This was driven by increased household energy bills due to the price cap hike, a rise in the cost of resale cars and fuel, as well as higher prices in restaurants and hotels. Costs of goods produced by factories and the prices of raw materials have also risen substantially and are now at their highest rates for at least 10 years. Some economists worry that Britain is entering a situation of high incomes and low unemployment with high prices. Consumers realised that inflation is not going away anytime soon. Analysts said the surge of inflation rates suggested that the possibility of the central bank raising interest rates in December increased. Earlier this month, the BOE announced its decision to keep interest rates unchanged at 0.1%, despite widespread speculation that it would raise rates to contain rising inflation. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was other there in the World News Special Correspondent Hasithi Alvisekar reporting from Leeds in the United Kingdom. EU defence ministers met in Brussels to discuss their strategic compass, a plan for greater shared military capability among the bloc's members. For more on this, we have other there in the World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting now from Helsinki in Finland. Yes, Anuradhi. European Union defence ministers met to discuss plans for a joint military force to up to 5,000 troops by 2025 to intervene in a range of crises and without relying on the United States according to a draft plan. The EU rapid deployment capacity should be made up of land, sea and air components that could be swapped in and out of any standing force, depending on the crisis, according to the confidential 28-page document. EU foreign and defence ministers began debating the plan in Brussels, aiming to settle on a final document by March next year. EU Presidency Chair Slovenia stated that government reactions were positive, but noted the traditional divide between EU states focused on Russia and those worried about terror attacks and instability on the bloc's southern flank. Two decades after EU leaders first agreed to set up a 50,000 to 60,000 strong force but failed to make it operational, the draft strategy by the bloc's foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell is the most concrete effort to create a standalone military force that does not rely on US assets. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. The UN's third committee has adopted a resolution condemning grave human rights violations in North Korea, which will now be put to a vote at the General Assembly session in December. Such a resolution has been adopted every year since 2005. The UN has adopted a resolution on North Korean human rights for the 17th consecutive year. 
adopted by the UN General Assembly Third Committee on Wednesday, the resolution condemns what it called the North's, quote, systematic and gross violations of human rights. The resolution, adopted unanimously by member states, expressed concerns over continuing reports of human rights violations in North Korea that include torture as well as other cruel treatment or punishment. It also calls for the regime to shut political prison camps and immediately release all political prisoners without conditions. To improve overall human rights conditions, the resolution highlights the importance of engaging in dialogue with Pyongyang, including inter-Korean talks. Moreover, it also urged the regime to resume the reunions of families who have been separated since the Korean War. This year's resolution also notes how the humanitarian situation in the North has been exacerbated by the pandemic, which prompted the closing down of the regime's border. It also calls for the regime to fully cooperate with the COVAX facility, as well as other global bodies, to ensure the timely delivery and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines for its people. While South Korea did not co-sponsor the resolution for the third consecutive year, it did join the document's adoption by consensus. The resolution will now be put to a vote at the UN General Assembly next month. Germans and Austrians are rushing to get vaccinated against the coronavirus as infections soar across Europe and governments impose restrictions on the unvaccinated. Germans and Austrians have been rolling up their sleeves on Wednesday to get their COVID vaccines, a sign that strong arm tactics against the unvaccinated could be having an effect. Infections in both countries are soaring, prompting governments to clamp down on people refusing to have their shots. Parts of Germany, including the capital Berlin, are demanding proof of vaccination or recent recovery from COVID-19 for all indoor leisure activities. Ost Austria has ordered a lockdown on the roughly 2 million people who are not fully vaccinated. And the new restrictions appear to be working. The German health ministry said 436,000 people received a shot on Tuesday, including 300,000 boosters, the highest number in about three months. Meanwhile, official data in Austria showed the number of vaccines administered daily had jumped to about 73,000 in the last week, up from 20,000 in October, although the vast majority of those were booster shots. About 65% of Austria's population and about 68% of Germany's are fully vaccinated, well behind countries like Italy and Spain that were much harder hit in the early waves of the pandemic. For comparison, about 58% of the US population is fully vaccinated, according to researchers at Our World in Data. A European regulatory panel voted against the approval of Biogen's Alzheimer's disease drug Adilhelm in a possible blow to the prospects of the drug already grappling with a slow rollout in the United States. Another possible setback for Biogen's controversial Alzheimer's drug. A European regulatory panel gave Adilhelm the thumbs down Wednesday. The European Medicines Agency usually follows the panel's recommendations. Adelhelm grabbed headlines in June when U.S. regulators approved it as the first new treatment for the memory-robbing disease in nearly two decades, even though an independent regulatory panel had voted against it. Adelhelm has been mired in controversy, and uptake for the pricey drug has been slow in the United States as hospitals and insurers await a decision on U.S. government coverage for the drug. Some doctors said clinical trial results were inconsistent and that additional proof was needed. And on Monday, Biogen said its veteran research chief who had led development of that drug was leaving the company. Shares of Biogen, which have fallen by about a fourth in the past three months, extended their decline in early trading Wednesday. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute.
Prince Charles said that Britain's Queen Elizabeth was all right, but that at the age of 95, it was not quite as easy for his mother as it used to be. The spokesperson of Iraq's foreign ministry, Ahmed al Sahaf, said 430 immigrants in Minsk will board the evacuation flight towards the cities of Ibril and Baghdad. Greek public health sector workers protested in Athens as hospitals have become overwhelmed by a new surge in COVID-19 cases, and authorities consider further restrictions. Roads on Christmas Island were closed as they turned scarlet with thousands of red crabs emerging from the forest to begin their annual migration journey to the ocean on the island off the coast of Western Australia. Scientists are combing Ireland's west coast for seaweed to feed the cattle and sheep after research showed it could substantially reduce the amount of climate warming methane they produce. And finally tonight, known for its connections to the British royal family, this year a section of Windsor Great Park will be lit up and guests given the chance to enjoy a range of colourful light and sound installations. Opening to the public, Windsor Great Park Illuminated promises to offer dazzling lights and breathtaking projections. Richard Gessgornel, the Vice President of Arts and Entertainment for IMG, said it is the first light trail to be held on the Crown Estate in Windsor Great Park and it's very exciting to be bringing it to the public this year. Set around the park's obelisk pond, the event has been created and produced by events and talent company International Management Group. Among the other things to do are several festive light installations that make great spots for pictures as well as hologram films projected in between two trees. The display is expected to run until the 9th of January 2022. In case you've missed any of our stories that we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Suzanne Shanali will join you again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Anradi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.